Uh, yeah, and we have our uh, another special speaker uh, today. Uh, it is such a pleasure for me to uh, have uh, uh, Shiri Ginosar. Um, she is a, a computing in, uh, innovation postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley, and she has done so many interesting work and very creative. Um, uh, these, uh, you know, these models of current AIs uh, on um, many interesting projects that she will hopefully share a gist of that with us. I can, uh, you know, tell you about the understanding the evolution of uh, images that was very striking to me, as well as the dance project that she did and other interesting things that she tries to go beyond the uh, only pixels, you know. Uh, so, Shri, go ahead and uh, uh, please start your talk. Oh, thank you so much. So, um, hi, I'm Shiri, and I'd like to talk to you today about um, the art of deception, or basically using uh, perception as a creative material. And um, I have a lot of material, but I want this. I know it's kind of strange to do this over Zoom. Uh, people are kind of shy to, to, to budge in, barge in, but um, it can really be a conversation. We can take it this uh, anywhere that you want. Uh, it could be kind of like a fireside chat. It could be, you know, we can make it this into different things. But um, so I want to encourage you, if you have questions, you could just like, just to start talking because I don't have the chat on and I can't man all these things, but just uh, feel free to, to just stop me at any point. And I want to say that because I know that it's, it's, you know, this whole remote thing is kind of, you know, strange. So, okay, so let's start talking and I, I want to get you into the mood. So I want us to look at a video together to start with. And um, this is a really nice uh, music video by Michel Gondry that he made for the Chemical Brothers. And I want you to really notice what is going on. I want you to listen and I want you to look at what is going, at what is going on in, in this video. zoned out a little bit in the beginning there because you know you look at this thing and you think to yourself okay I'm looking out the window of a train I've been there it's it's kind of nice and relaxing but it's also a little bit mind numbing so you kind of zone out and you're like okay but then suddenly it hits you that there's a surprise here so um, actually all the visuals are yes Sorry, uh, I think that did you, did you want the student to tell you what they think or uh, you just want to tell them uh, they can tell me where I, if, I can't really see you guys. I can only yeah. see your, okay. So if you want to say something, just like say it. Yeah, if you, uh, please, if your uh, students want to say something, just unmute and say, it. Um, I can also. Well, actually, before you do that, now that we've restopped, I want to ask um, the audio, is it reasonable? Is it too loud? Is it too uh, low of the, of the videos? This is a good time to, to fix this because we're going to have a lot of audio and videos. 
I think it was reasonable, maybe a little, maybe a little less, like, um, but well, I think it was good. So. Okay, we made it a little bit less loud. If it's nice, not going forward, complain. Yes. Okay, excellent. So if anyone wants to say what they think, or should I read it? So Ben says, um, it's repeating scene in sync to the music sections, moving. Yes on to the next uh, loop of the scene as the track moves to the next section. Simon says, the camera feels like it is bouncing in rhythm. That's it. That is, that is, that is wonderful. That is, those are wonderful observations, but like guys, just turn on your microphones and just talk. Okay, don't make Ali read all of your, all of your things. So it will be more, just more interactive, you know? Um, Okay, so yes, that's exactly what's going on. Everything is being repeated and is synced to the music and synced to the beat. And Michel Gaudry is very good at this. He did this a couple of times and amazingly he did this by hand. So there's a very interesting uh, YouTube video. It's kind of like a, a documentary about the making of this video. And you see how they charted out the entire score of the, of the music and planned out exactly what they're gonna show. Um, and the visuals and, and literally, literally composed this by hand. There's no, there's no AI here or anything like that. So the interesting thing is that it, this kind of combination between your different senses plays a trick on you and gives you this surprise, which makes it interesting. But if you didn't notice what was going on, you would think, oh yeah, you know, it, it looks like it's real, but it's not, there's nothing real about this. It's completely composed. Okay, so, so let's take a step back and, and talk a little about, put, put ourselves in context and look at the history of what people did in order to depict the world. From the very beginning of art, um, the main goal of art was to, you know, capture the world realistically. So this started with, with cave drawings of prehistoric people who saw these big cows with the big, um, uh, big horns and, and wanted to, uh, wanted to capture them with coal on the on the uh, walls of their caves. And going forward many, many years, people got more sophisticated. Um, this is a very nice um, mosaic from the Byzantine time. And there's already a lot of dress here and different people and a lot of details. Um, but at this time, all of the depiction of people was very, very flat. So there's almost no depth in the image. And everybody is kind of frontal and has a very um, just nondescript uh, facial emotion status. You know, everybody's kind of like mm, severe. And going forward, you know, this is the beginning of the Renaissance. So this is Giotto. And this is one of the first times that uh, depth appears in an image. And the way he does it is kind of, it's a nice trick. He puts this um, person in green in front of Christ. And it kind of draws your attention inwards into the image. And you can notice, you know, people are not frontal here anymore. This is kind of a um, uh, diverging uh, uh, style from, from the Byzantine style. And you can see motion in their faces. So it's becoming more and more realistic. Things get even better in the Renaissance. Here we already have um, linear perspective. We have the little people in the back, you know, are smaller and we have people in the front which are bigger and it kind of makes you feel like everything is going into the image and you can kind of walk into the scene. And of course, going a little bit forward, you know, we almost achieve perception, uh, perfection in, in painting. So this is uh, Van Eyck and this is a beautiful painting where he has uh, here geometric orthogonal perspective and there's you know you can really walk into this image there's a lot of detail if you blow up for example the chandelier you can see how the light is bouncing on the metal the little um, uh, flames of the candles are very very nicely painted everything is very realistic and even better, he puts a mirror behind those, uh, those two people who are getting married here, and you can get even a double depth in the image. So you can walk into the image and you can even see the backs of the people and the people who are looking at the people who are getting married. Um, so this is, is really wonderful. And even you can see the, 
the little beads, the glass, uh, the glass beads that are hanging up, it just is, is almost perfect. Of course, all of this, this race of perfection basically ended with the invention of the camera. Because then you could just walk out or look out of your window and take a snapshot and you're done, right? You know, this is like, there you go. This is the world. The world, you know, it is. This is it. Anything you want, you could take a picture of. And it kind of um, made this, uh, this break in the art world because suddenly, you know, the people who would do your, your portrait for a lot of money were out of, were out of, were out of work in a way. Of course, this raises uh, different questions. So once you have an image that you can take and, and the pixels are real, then the question can become about whether, whether is, there, is this a real picture? Is this fake? You know, is this kiss that happened in Paris? Was it, was it really, did it really happen for real or was it staged? This one was staged by the way. Um, are aliens actually descending on New York or is this a movie? You know, is this a conspiracy theory? Or did people actually land on the moon or, or you know, can I believe the pixels of the camera or not? And um, interestingly, and interestingly for us, artists didn't actually give up after the invention of the camera. They actually became more sophisticated. So here, there is a nice example from Monet. It's an impressionist painting. And you can see a parade in Paris. There's a lot of people um, going and walking in the street. And um, you know, let's try let's try to get you uh, talking a little bit. So, like, what do you notice in this image, in this painting? Anybody? What's interesting about it? There's a lot of flags. There's a lot of flags. Yes. And what's happening to the flags? Oh, they're waving. So it's like depicting motion. And they're kind of blowing in the wind. Why do you think they're blowing in the wind? What makes you think that? They're blurry. That's true. They are blurry. But are they really blurry? Like, is it is it fuzzy, like a Gaussian filter on top of them? We're, we're like blow up a section here. Um, they're not like blurry in the in the normal sense, but they're not rigidly defined so like the looseness of the brush strokes and the way that they all kind of have that implies the wind and the motion exactly exactly so these flags are basically built out of strips of blue and yellow and red which is the french plan but they're not it's spatially imprecise they're kind of jumbled strokes of paint even though each stroke of paint is not blurry the juxtaposition of them is, is kind of all over the place. And the interesting thing about this is that this kind of matches really nicely to our peripheral vision. So in our peripheral vision, we see things kind of in a spatially imprecise way. It's not that we see things blurry, it's just that we don't really care where exactly they are in the image. So if you kind of look at this painting in a glance, you kind of think to yourself, oh, everything is fine. But when you actually look and take a very close look at it, you see that everything is really, really jumbled because you're using your, um, your actual, you know, attentive vision in the middle of your, of your, of your viewing field. And that is more, um, takes more into account the spatial arrangement of stuff. And so really to get a sense of this painting, you have to kind of look in, you, you, every time you, you take a good look at it, you get a different sense of what's going on because your periphery is giving you a different, uh, a different sensation. And that's what kind of gives this, this vibrant motion. So in a way, you know, you get an impression, that's why they call it impressionist, because you get an impression of what's going on at every glance, but it's not really correct. And this is how Monet is playing with your visual system and making you feel like there's something real here, like motion, which is really not in the pixels themselves. Okay, so, you know, fast forward many, many years and, and we have computer graphics. Uh, and... sorry, sorry, yes? can, I, can I interrupt and be a little perfectionist? I think that I really love these slides. Uh, there is this um, um, panel field order from 
key, keynote that uh, maybe you want to close it. Oh, no. Oh, no. Thank you. You know, this happened to me before, and I should know this already. That it okay, perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, oh, why didn't you say that before? Okay, good. To make a post note, always, always close the build order. <coughs> okay. Uh, so we went to computer graphics, right? And suddenly, oh no, now I don't have my little timer. Okay, I'm gonna have to look at the clock. Um, and suddenly, you could model the world uh, physically, right? You can make a physical model of the light and the and the objects in the scene, and you can render them perfectly. But you could almost render them too perfect. This is, you know, what you get out of, of graphics a lot of the time is super, super real. But it kind of makes you feel, um, it gives you a strange feeling. It's kind of too realistic. You know, everything is a little bit too clean. Everything is a little bit too robotic. Do you, do you know why that is? Why does it make you feel that way? Okay, so I'll, I'll give you my idea. My idea is that what's missing is, is the noise. What's missing is the junk, is the dirt, is the cracks in the sidewalk that are kind of uh, random, the, the suit on the buildings, you know, all the, all, the, all the noise, all the junk basically, where our visual system is really used to seeing all this noise in, in the outside world. And there's a lot of beauty in this complexity that when you take it away, because you can't model it physically, it's too complex to model, you know, our visual system just jumps and is like, oh, something is really wrong with this image. And so this is very important perceptually. And a lot of what I do is try to capture this complexity of the, of the visual world. Okay, so we talked a little bit of our perception I want to make one more note about it is that a lot of perception is really in your head. It's not really what you see. Okay, so here's an example. Um, if you look at this image and you look at the at the thing that's that's in a red box, what is what do you see? A Anybody? soccer player. A player. Yes. Soccer player. Yes. Great soccer player. But do you really think that there's a soccer player there? Like if I take him and I magnify him, eh, it's just a bunch of pixels, right? It's like there's white pixels, there's black pixels, you can't really see the head, there's a little bit of legs there, but there's really, you know, there's, there's really no player here, right? Do you agree? Like, if you look at this, and this, it's like, eh. so a lot of what makes you think there's a soccer player here is actually the context. You know, there's a soccer field, it's in situation, you're kind of like filling in the details. Here's another example. This is a, an image from a video that Antonio shot. And um, it's kind of blurry, but, but your brain can fill in the details. What, are you, what do you see here? A man sitting at a computer with like a phone to his ear. Exactly. But if I show you the details, you suddenly see that everything is wrong, right? He's not talking on the phone. He's talking in the shoe and he's not looking at a computer. He's looking at a, at a garbage can. Okay. And the mouse is actually a stapler and there's a toaster there. So everything is wrong, but the spatial configuration of the scene is fine. And if you blur it out, your brain is just like, oh, this is fine. You know, I'm just going to fill in the details. So there are these loopholes of perception, and this is a great opportunity for design. And this is how we're going to um, weave in things that are not real, but kind of make you think that they are, as long as we're careful to guard the important bits. There are some, there are some anchors of perception that we should care about, and, and we have to make sure that they're there, and your brain is going to do the rest. Okay? So, what I'm going to cover uh, today is I'm going to look at multiple examples of this. So we're going to look a little bit at work that um, looks at different senses and putting them together. So here we're going to talk about audio and motion, so vision and, and hearing. We're going to talk about uh, modeling these complexities. So 
the very, very fine details of individual appearance. And um, we're gonna talk about using uh, time or using the, passion, the passing of time as a creative material. I'm gonna stop here and ask if there's any questions or complaints and then I will continue. Okay, so let's talk first about um, audio and, and motion. We're gonna talk about how people move when they speak. And it's the, the, what I'm talking about is gonna look something like this. I know, how is it the personality travels? Well, maybe okay. there'll be some sort of physical so, explanation so, for it. So people move when they speak and these are called uh, conversational gestures, okay? This is the kind of stuff that we do when, when we speak and we never do basically when we don't, when we don't talk. And this type of gesture is not the only form of communicative gesture. There's a continuum from language that accompanies speech, sorry, language that accompanies motion that accompanies language to uh, motion that replaces language. So for example, sign language is a, is a language of its own. It doesn't need speech to go with it. Um, emblems are like Italianite. There's all kinds of things that Italians do, which kind of have meanings that people agree upon. So it's almost like a language. But we're not going to talk about these things. We're going to talk about uh, the motion that accompanies speech when you do talk. <coughs> So what we want here is we want to learn about how people use gestures when they speak. And to do that, we're gonna take in a raw audio signal of speech. So literally the waveform. And from that, we wanna directly predict hand and arm gestures. So it's gonna look something like this. Hearing. Texas so this is a really, really hard task. Okay, there's, the FBI... it's an ill-defined problem. There's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the audio and the motion because I can say something today and move in a particular way and, and do it completely different tomorrow. Um, it's not synchronous. Um, the, the motion is, is often not synchronous to the related um, utterance. And it's also a task that would be really hard for people to do or even to annotate for you. So getting supervised learning in this setup is, is really, really hard. And what we wanna do is we wanna, you know, learn about this in a kind of a, in the wild setting. So what we did is we went in and collected a large data set of people who are speaking. And for each frame, we uh, annotated it automatically using an out of the box uh, 2D pose detection. So it kind of finds the pose of the arms of the hand and the hands of the people. And the data looks kind of like this. Waiting outside. Why are you telling me all this? And you're not going to believe what they said they want to do. Isn't that disgusting? It's 2012. We're still not on the. And then report it to the police. <laughs> Even Lauer's conversation light, more photons per second, still none of the too young to be vaccinated. And why would you choose not to okay. do that? So you can already see that people are very different in how they gesticulate. But within a person, there's a lot of repetition. And here I'm showing clusters in, um, in the rows of uh, clusters of, of gestures. And this is because people just tend to perform the same motions over and over again, because they have their, you know, typical style. And that's great because it gives us a learning signal. And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna model each person individually. And the way we're gonna predict gestures from audio is we're literally gonna take the raw audio uh, as input. We're gonna treat it like an image. So we're gonna think about it as a spectrogram. We're gonna stick it into a neural network and we're gonna output a temporal series of poses. And what each one of these really is, is just a vector of numbers, but they represent the pose of the arms and hands of a person. And the result looks like this. So, you know, try and separate the two. Now, okay. Now the good um, news is... The one thing to notice is, you know, for this given audio, uh, we predict a stack of these poses and we have two kinds of losses. One is the regression loss to this pseudo ground truth of 2D poses that we have. But um, what we really want is we want to generate motion according to the style of this particular person. And so we add another adversarial loss that will tell us 
uh, whether the emotion is real or not with respect to this person. And this makes a really big difference perceptually because I'm going to show you here on the left, you're going to see the result when you only have regression. And what happens when you do that is that you kind of get something that's very close to the mean. So the motion is just very, very slow. It's kind of like you're going through honey. And when you add this adversarial loss, you kind of snap to one mode of the output because you know, I could have predicted different gestures, but I, I'm going to pick just one and make it look real. Okay, so that's going to be on the right hand side. So, you know, and try it makes and separate the, the two. Likely. It makes it now, look more real. Now, the good it makes us feel a little bit better about, about what we're seeing. And here, by the way, I'm pasting in the face. I'm not predicting the face in this work, but I'm pasting in the ground with face to give you more perceptual context to see what to kind of understand what you're seeing. Okay, so we can also um, look at prediction results for different people and just look what look at what it looks like. Talking about the instantaneous so here's the rate, stick the rate figure is a just when the concentration and is... And I'm putting the ground truth video on the bottom right, even though you know I could really have predicted any um, realistic motion. I don't really want to predict the real one, but it's just for reference. Energy to boil. Higher kinetic energy, higher temperature. Logo in order to make it more modern. Yeah. Yeah, appropriate noise for so that. Thank you. That is where this method fails. So we're only taking audio as input. There's no uh, like, there's no you know text. There's no semantics. So the main limitation here is that even though we're using hours of data for training, um, we really there's really not enough data to capture the semantic, you know, fine grain semantics in order to predict metaphoric gestures. So I'm going to show you a video here, and I want you to notice what happens when he says the word random. states involved in the random motion. So we, motion. we don't get this so random. You know, is the, the, more... the, the circular motion that goes with random, we just can't predict that. But we do predict the beat motion, which is these up and down uh, repetitive motion that kind of cut the sentence uh, temporally and make us feel like the person is actually moving while they're talking, which is, which is nice. Another thing that's, that's interesting about this um, is that um, it's a little bit hard to do this kind of work the way that I described it. And that is because the most important part of the body when you're speaking with your hands, basically, is, is the hands, right? And the hands are very, very small in an image. And um, they're very articulated, the fingers. And we're just not there yet in terms of uh, computer vision, 3D reconstruction techniques to get really good hand um, estimations. And so our entire, everything we did depends on the fact that we have good, good you know, detections of, of body pose and that's not the case. So here's an example, just a randomly picked example from Ellen, Ellen's videos. And you can see what happens if you just use an image-based system to get the hand uh, reconstructions. To a CVS for one item. And uh, the receipt was so long that I couldn't even believe it. I called it outrageous. I, I called it mind boggling. I called it long. Okay, so this is complete and junk, right? Like if you tried to time, request to this, it, everything would, would fail miserably. So what do you do? Um, one thing that we noticed that is actually super interesting is that there is a really high correlation between the motion of the arms and uh, the shape of the hand. So we're gonna do a trick and we're going to take as input, not only the audio, uh, if, if we want to get better hands, but you can look at uh, just taking the arms as input and only from the arms, uh, the arm motion, you can predict uh, a pretty good um, shape of the hands, which is, which is almost seems magical. And so if you do this body to hand thing, what you get looks like this. electrons around it, the atomic oxygen would have six, 
So it has two more than it normally has. So there's like, there's no pixels atom, going in so here. There's no audio going of... into here. There's literally just the motion of the arms. And it's, it's, it's amazing that it even works. But um, it, again, there's not enough information, right? So it's not enough to capture metaphoric. So if you see uh, here, um, she's going to say one and I just call it in yellow, and this is the ground truth video, okay? To a CVS for one item. And uh, okay, the receipt so if you was just so take long, the arms I couldn't as even input, believe it. you're not going to get that. It looks like this. To a CVS for one item. And uh, the bigger. receipt was so, so long that I couldn't even You can even do believe. an extra trick and you can say, okay, well, I can take in the, the body, but I can also just look at the, at the input images because that's what image-based reconstruction does anyways. And together with this body prior, I can get a much better hand reconstruction. And so here on the left is the, is the body only input, no audio, no pixels. And on the right, I have the body and the image together. to a CVS for one item. And uh, the receipt was so long that I couldn't even believe it. I called it outrageous. I, I called it mind boggling. I called it long. So this and is already much better. Now and this, this is time, kind of like, you know, this is stuff that we can work with already. And it looks much more realistic. Are there any face restrictions according to just like human anatomy that are also used within the model? Sorry, say again. Are there any just base restrictions on what movement is possible according to human anatomy? Like you can't completely, I don't know. Yeah. Um, not, in, oh, sorry, I'm uh, speaking to you from the garage. So there's, there's exciting background noise. Um, not in my model, okay? But um, there is in those, um, when we use, when we use ground truth that's coming from uh, 2D reconstruction of key points or 3D reconstruction of hands in this case, um, those models have a lot of, of uh, you know, human pose priors built into them, uh, but we don't. So we're at, we're kind of the goal of the, of the body to hands uh, angle is to add an additional prior, but one that is not based on, on you know, physics that you might calculate from human bodies, but it's, it's based on a data-driven prior. So if you've seen enough bodies, you can infer this automatically. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Cool. All right. So let's see, what time is it? When do, do we stop at, uh, at on the hour, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, we could we could go a little further if you want. No, no, no. I'm just like I can, I can. I have a, I have a lot of stuff, but I'm just gonna cut accordingly. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the more interesting. So I think that we we said two p.m. Uh, for students, but it's yeah, that's fine. Okay, so okay, so in this um, work, we really only cared to predict two D motion because we that's what we were we were interested in, and these stick figures are a nice output representation but they don't really provide you enough perceptual context with, like as a viewer to actually see that what the result looks like did we do a good job okay so instead we can synthesize a video an actual video of the speaker so we wh what are we going to do we're going to take a real video of this speaker and um for each frame we can uh, do the same trick where we get a, a 2d pose detection and our goal is to learn the mapping between these 2D pose skeletons back to the real frame of, of the person. And this is based on picks to picks. You know, you probably you know Isola, so this is, this is based on his work, but we're gonna do this for a video. And if you do that, what you get is something like this, uh, where again, I'm pasting in the ground truth face key points because I'm not predicting them, but I need them to make a video, right? So it's gonna look like this. So, you know, try and separate the two. Now, now the good news is, these days, very few people will say they are completely anti vaccine Okay, so I just want to, I just want to, like, like focus you on this. This is a completely fake video, okay? It's completely synthesized. There is, like, it, there's nothing real about it. And it's, it's actually being predicted from raw audio um, with this uh, 2D, uh, you know, system that gives us only the pose. 
and and that's kind of amazing. It's it's the coolest thing about this is that not only can we synthesize a realistically looking video, but we also managed to capture a very convincing motion of the person. Um, it, mostly, what what makes you think that it's good is those beat gestures. It's like, okay, I'm talking and I'm chopping up my sentence and there's kind of going in the same rhythm as my voice. And that is convincing enough um, for people to think that, that this is real. Okay. But we're making fake videos, basically. Okay. So it's interesting to think about what can we do in order to decide whether a video was faked or not. And it turns out that the same kind of idea can be applied to forensics as well. So I'm going to show you an example. Let's look at Obama and let's look at um, this is from his address to the nation, which he used to do every week. And I want you to say to see what he does when he says, you know, hello, everybody. Hi, 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 everybody. Hi everybody. Did you see hi, that? Everybody. Hi everybody. Every time he says hi everybody, hi, everybody goes like this. Hi everybody. Hi everybody. Hi everybody. Hi. He has this like upward motion. And basically, if you have the right words and you have the right motion together, then it's Obama. But if you try to do some deep fake of him and you try to change his lips, his lips and you know make him say something different, you wouldn't get the right motion to go with this. And this is like a great signal to see that something is fake. And this is uh, a really nice line of work that uh, Shruti Agrawal did at UC Berkeley with Hani Farid, where they look at exactly this kind of thing. So it, it, it uses the, you know, the whole of the person, all of the details in multiple modalities to detect things that are fake. All right, I'm going to move uh, a little bit to something else. If there's any questions, this is a good time. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this idea of learning all the little details of a, person, a person's appearance. And we're going to consider a very special style of gesture, which is dance. And it's an art form. It's been around since the beginning of time. But frankly, nobody's really figured out how to capture the little subtleties of it. And what we're going to do is we're going to start, we're just going to start directly by looking at a demo. Okay, so look at what, uh, what we can do. is we're taking this source video, we're detecting its pose, and we're puppeting our target person to dance in the same way. And it looks really nice. But I'm actually using a trick on you. I'm using a perceptual loophole. And, and this is really interesting. We usually don't show this. But it turns out that the music is very helpful. OK? I'm going to show you exactly the same result without the audio. And I want you to notice if it looks different to you. Okay, anyone? Mostly just looks super unnatural, where before it looked like it actually like was dancing. <laughs> it's awful, right? It's like everything is moving, it's kind of wobbly, and like, yeah, you know, um, just, just not right, right? And that's really interesting. It's exactly the same pixels. Okay, I just turned off the audio. 
But when I show it to you with audio, your perceptual system is like, whoa, there's like music and there's dancing and it's together and you're filling in the holes. You really are. And it's very important, it turns out, when you're showing a demo, if you guys go and do things in design or in, in, even in AI, to kind of set it up in a way that, that makes people be in their happy places and use multiple senses when they're, when they're looking at something and it actually makes it look better than, than it really is. And our goal here is actually not to make a perfect video. I, I don't really want to be in the business of, of making people do things that they didn't do. Our goal is to study you know, the statistics and whatever, but, um, but it is very helpful uh, to use these this different senses. Okay, so what are we doing here? In a way, um, it turns out that we can use the same technology we talked about before to transfer dance motion from one person who knows how to dance to a different person who is a terrible dancer, like my co-author here, um, Ting Kui. And this is basically motion that's not conditioned on audio, it's conditioned on different people. And training is the same. We train a cycle from you to your stick figure and back to you. And uh, you can think about it as trying to go from you to a full reconstruction of you through this tiny little bottleneck, which is these uh, 2D poses that are not learned. And um, the idea here is to get, learn a really good mapping from this stick figure back to the appearance of the person, because I really want to model what he looks like. I want to capture all the little minute details of, of his body and the way that he kind of you know, looks when he's moving. And I want to get the stuff that you can never really annotate. I want to get all the complexity, this, this beauty and the details. This is what I want. So the goal here is not to start from a single image of a person and make them dance. The goal is to actually model this person. And for that, I need a bunch of training data of this person from different poses. And at test time, we unwrap the cycle and we put a different person on the other end. And so here, test and training are not the same on purpose. And this is different from uh, a lot of other methods. And these stick figures are a nice representation in the middle because they're kind of agnostic for appearance. Like you could be you know, bigger or smaller in width, but, uh, but it doesn't really matter for, for your skeletal structure. And if we manage to learn a good model of our target guy, we should be able to sample any new pose from this ballerina and synthesize a new image of, of Ting Kui. And this is good because a good model of appearance should generalize to new poses. So I'm using video synthesis kind of like at school. It's like show your work. You know, the generated video is, is, is a test of whether our modeling or perception of this guy really worked. Okay, so we do some tricks to uh, make this not, you know, frame by frame and achieve uh, a temporal coherence, which is, which is important uh, perceptually. But I actually want to talk about something else. I want to talk about the fact that um, the face is very important perceptually. Okay, and, and we didn't invent this. This is, this is uh, Renoir. And um, there's something really interesting about this painting, which is basically that there's different resolution of, of painting between different parts of the image, right? The face is very, very sharp and the eyes are extremely sharp. You can even see like the, the glint of the, of the lighting reflecting on her pupil. But everything else is fuzzy and it's kind of like the flags we saw before. It's like not really in place. And it does something very, very interesting. It makes you draw your gaze to her eyes, which are the most expressive part of, of, uh, of the face. It gives you an emotional reaction and it makes you ignore everything else because everything else is in your periphery, which is not really, um, not really uh, attuned to spatial relationships anyways. And it kind of mimics our own perceptual experience when we gaze into someone else's eyes, like somebody that we really love or somebody that we really want to listen to, it's always, you know, everything else about their body is in the periphery, okay? So, so this is kind of the trick that uh, Renoir is doing, is playing on you, and we're going to play the same trick, okay? So, so 
you know, this is this was done before amazing GANs were around. And so we didn't have the technology to make everything look perfect. But we said, okay, the face is important. If we get the face right, people will say, oh, this looks nice. So we actually devote a special GAN just to the face uh, region in order to correct it and look more realistic. And it makes a big difference. So if this is the baseline, this is after temporal smoothing, this is what happens when we add an additional GAN for the face itself. And it kind of looks almost like Caroline, who, who used to be my undergrad and, and did this work. And now she's, she's a full grown uh, PhD uh, with you guys at MIT. Let me just look at the time. And, um, and you can see her, her dancing in all of these videos uh, like this one. And we can also do the same thing. We take a motion of one person and we can apply it to many people. Uh, and there, when it's small, of course, the face uh, matters less. and we turn it into a controllable interactive application that got a lot of attention to the field of image and video synthesis. It appeared in popular press, it exhibited in museums, it was incorporated into stage performances, and now my co-author Ting Hui, the same guy who doesn't know how to dance, uh, even turned this into an app that you can download for free from the App Store and you can dance and TikTok and whatever you want with it. And, um, and this is interesting, but um, another direction that we kind of have been discussing of where to take this technology is to provide a platform um, for capturing performance as a form of intellectual property for, for choreography. Because it turns out that unlike musical score that can be copyrighted, there's no way to copyright dance. In fact, there wasn't even a way to capture dance in the West until the 20th century. So most of the ballets that we know of, like Swan Lake and you know, all of these, even the famous ones, haven't really survived in their original form. Until this day, there isn't an agreed upon notation of dance. And this is just one example, which is called Lebanon notation. But all of the, all of the forms of, of, of notation, um, they don't have a way to accurately capture all the small details. They're not parametric, they're not scalable. Every time you come up with a different move, you have to come up with a different uh, notation. And our, our idea is that capturing things the way that we do can, can try and get to these, to these issues and, and maybe offer a new solution. So we talked a little bit about the fact that there's artifacts, but um, actually it turns out that that is the interesting part about this technology to a lot of artists. So here's, here's one example um, where the same uh, Ting Hui's little company had a gig where they made this music video. It's really celebrating uh, the problems in, in this technology and making them into art. And here's another example that I really love. This isn't actually using our uh, work, it's using vid to vid, but it's very, very similar. So you can ignore the differences and just focus on what this person is doing with this.
effect. But um, Jake here really loves those and he's actually pushing it like to the extreme extreme. So there's all this hair and the feathers, which are really, really hard to capture uh, for Gans. But, uh, but he's just like, let's throw it all in and, and just let it, you know, be artistic. And, and, and this is kind of what uh, he's been looking for in using these technologies. Okay, but, but there's also a limitation on how you can use this kind of stuff for art because essentially what we're doing when we generate images or we generate video or motion using a GAN is that we're always using a training set, which is real, okay? And we're trying to teach AI how to make us more of this real thing. Okay, so, so we want to, you know, maybe generalize out of the distribution of the training set, but not by much. We still want to, to keep things realistic. That's our training signal. And this is, this becomes a limitation when you want to do something like this. So, so these are visuals from uh, Bjork's uh, Tabula Rasa uh, music video. And this actually goes with a, with a large uh, performance and show that she had uh, a year ago. And what they wanted here, and, and they actually came to us to ask for help in order to do this, and, and we couldn't help them. What they wanted to do is they wanted to have this marriage between a human and an orchid. Okay, so, so they want the motion, and, and they use mocap for this, but they want the motion to come from a human, but the visuals and uh, kind of the embellishment to come from a flower. And there's nothing that we can do to help them because we don't yet have this ability to do this compositionality between different realistic things to make something, uh, to make a new kind of life form, if you may, uh, with AI. We, we just can't do, there's, we don't know how to do this. Uh, so this is something that is that is a limitation of, of training to uh, to do realism, and uh, it, it's a very interesting future direction from work. If you're looking for something really cool to do, this this kind of uh, idea uh, can give you uh, can give you a nice direction that we don't know how to solve yet. Wait, so how did they do that? How did they? They, they did it by hand. They did it by hand. So. Oh. Uh, so they, uh, this is a really cool artist. Uh, he's also a professor, I think, in Hong Kong or Taiwan, something like that. And um, they they did motion capture on the people, and so they have the motion signatures. But uh, everything else is uh, hand designed, uh, you know, three D models and uh, and motion. That is that is uh, basically put together with with the, it's dressed you know it's uh it's dressed on top of the human motion so what they wanted would it have been similar to uh i don't know people who were here in the class the other day there was some ai that could make pictures out of like the texture of the skin of an elephant or something or like uh the texture of noodles would it have been similar to that or like you had a face and then you draw it with the texture of I don't know, say noodles, and then you change the noodles to make it look like it's talking. Yeah, so that's one. Um, so you mean like the Geiger paper, right? The the counterfactual paper. Uh, and there's also, I, I know you guys looked yesterday at Dali. So there's different, um, yeah, that, that's one approach to do that. It's a little bit, right now, that technology is not yet Very but if you take those noodles and you make them in the shape of a dog or whatever, it's still noodles, you know, and you just cut them into a dog. There's nothing that really takes the texture and like kind of applies it onto the 3D form. So you see here, if you look at the at the texture of the flower, it really changes with the articulation of the flower, right? If you just take noodles and you, you know, you make the right mask for them, it's still, it's not yet realistic, right? And this is again, something we don't know how to do. We don't know if you look at the cycle GAN results, for example, um, it doesn't conform to the 3D shape of the object. It doesn't actually respect that. So 
yes, that's in the right direction, but it, it's not yet there. All of this is open to problems. Answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it's just stuff to think about. It's neat, neat stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's, this is really cool. I don't know how to solve this, but it's this is a cool, this is a cool, cool idea. Cool, cool direction. Okay, I literally have three minutes. So I am going to and I have more stuff. So um, the rest of the stuff I wanted to talk about would have been um, kind of uh, designing with with time, using time as, as, a, as an interesting medium. And I guess what I can do is just, just tell you two different highlights, okay? So I'm not gonna really uh, walk you through all of the story here, but um, let's see. If we, think about, if we think about time and we think about images, not from video, but like large collections of images, um, there's something really interesting about them. And the interesting thing is, is that a lot of the time when you think about historical data, you think about text, but, but you don't really write everything down. And, and those are things that are really captured in images. And we're lucky, we're very, very lucky that we have now basically more than a hundred years of historical visual record. And the things that you get from that are things that are, you know, you can look at this image and kind of think to yourself, you know, if a hundred years from now, somebody wanted to explain in a history book, what are hipsters, it would be really, really hard because, you know, here you can see the difference between nerds and hipsters. And, you know, what is it that makes these guys look cool? Is it, is it the hats? Is it the scarves? Is it the Instagram filter that was slapped on the image? Like, is, you know, what is it? It's really hard to say in words. And in any case, we don't really bother to talk about these things when we write stuff down. And so historical images kind of captured this for us. Um, but of course, then we kind of, you know, if you took a collection of historical images, you kind of end up with, you know, a bunch of historical images that you need to sort through and you end up selling in a garage sale because it's too much work. So if there is a way to automatically get, um, you know, how do things change over time from images, that would be really cool. And that's uh, stuff that we've done a couple of times here. This is work with uh, historical yearbooks, high school yearbooks, um, which is a really nice source of data because there's spaces and they always stay the same, but what changes is fashions and, and social norms. And what you can do with, with a lot of data like this that has kind of a consistent subject matter, but changes over time is something uh, like Jason Sullivan here, who is an artist, has done with his graduating class versus his mother. So he graduated in 1988 from Fort Worth in Texas. And on the left, you see an average image of all the people in his classroom, the women and the men, versus um, on the right, the ones that came uh, from his mother's class of 67. And you can already see that there's big differences, right? People used to look different. They used to dress a little bit different. Uh, they used to treat the camera a little bit differently. And um, we did the same thing uh, with our data where we took, you know, a hundred years of photographs and we looked at averages of men versus women over time. And you can notice that people, um, uh, you know, look a little bit different, they, their hair is different, they, they smile more than they used to. You can quantify this kind of thing. Um, you can look for other um, characteristic uh, elements for different decades, like different uh, hairstyles that are uh, very dis distinctive. And uh, this gives you tools for analysis of, of creativity and fashion but we're not gonna look at this, but instead what we're gonna say is, okay, um, this is interesting. You can do this with faces, everything is very aligned. You can look at fashion, but what happens if you wanna think about time in, in the real world, in the outdoor world? How can you use a time as a, as, a, as a creative medium? And so one thing uh, we did afterwards is we went and looked at a lot of data uh, coming from street view images and um, we looked at 
whether we can say, okay, let's say I want to travel in time. I'm stuck in a pandemic and I want to go visit New York, but I want to make sure that I did it on a particular uh, Sunday afternoon in 2011. Okay, how can I do this? And so maybe I can use Flickr images if I want to go to Columbus Circle, but if I want to go to some random corner, there's just not, um, there's just not, the people just don't take pictures there. So what we did is we went and looked at uh, the Google Time Machine, which is basically your, your normal Street View uh, interface, but they actually keep historical images of the previous runs of the, of the cars through the city. And that gives you a single location with different lighting conditions and different weather conditions. And this is really cool because you can collect this uh, at a really large scale, like you know, all of New York or basically the entire world. And then for each location, you have uh, multiple snapshots of that place, only they're still very sparse. And to go to this place in a particular day and time, you have to learn how to fill in the gaps, okay? Uh, because you know the buildings stay the same, but uh, the weather conditions might change. So to travel in time, you want to take a particular image and you want to be able to change the lighting and the, and the weather. So basically what you want to do is you need to disentangle or learn to disentangle the things that are varying temporally versus the things that are permanent. And if you can do that, then you can use time basically to synthesize new things that are, you know, you never really captured. They might have existed, but you don't know because you weren't there. And so for a particular scene, you can do things like you can rotate the sun around, and this is completely synthetic, right? This is a result of, of what we do. Or you can um, copy uh, and paste buildings, for example. So you can modify the permanent factor and um, that would look uh, something like this, right? Here's, here's an inserted building. It looks perfect, but, but it's completely fake. And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, you know, just not gonna go into the technical detail of how it's done, but basically the thing that helps us is that we've seen the same place over and over again. The one thing I do wanna talk about is that the nugget, um, the technical nugget that we use here is that we can use a, um, a decomposition of the scene into two things that graphics uh, tells us that are, you know, um, physically correct, which is the difference between shading and reflectance, where shading kind of captures the shadows and the effects of the illumination on the scene. And the reflectance is the actual color. So I'm wearing an actual blue sweater. That would be the reflectance of, of the sweater. And then there's um, the effects of the light on it that, that puts in the shadow. And the interesting thing about, uh, about these, this, this shadow representations, this, the shading representation, is that we're, we, in our mind, we think about the fact that maybe shadows are gray. It's like if we think about them as grayscale, but they're actually not, okay? And this, this is the interesting thing perceptually here. And you can see this in this nice painting by Monet. Okay, so, so Monet is painting a grain stack that is sitting in a bed of snow on the ground. So the snow should be white, the ground is white, but there's actually two colors for the illumination. There's blue from the sky, and that is kind of an indirect diffuse light. And there is a direct light that is yellow from the sun. And if you look at the shadow that's being cast on the snow, in the shadow, it's blue because the direct light doesn't hit um, doesn't hit the snow, and so you mostly get the indirect uh, illumination from the sky. And it's more blue than the surrounding light, which has the yellow mixed into it. And Monet is doing a trick here where he's actually coloring with yellow to complement the blue just in the border to make it even more clear to your um, to your you know your center surround cells and your in your eyes that this is what's happening. Okay, so, so the trick here to get everything to look realistic was to say, okay, people before have kind of thought about shading as a grayscale thing. And um, most of the color in their models have gone to the reflectance images, but we actually use a two-toned shading where we take separately into account the blue and the yellow 
And we are trying to really capture a lot of the blue of the sky in the shading model and not in the reflectance model. And that kind of makes everything come uh, more together and look more realistic. And then we can say, okay, and when, you know, we generalize, we take uh, an image from a completely unseen place like Paris. We've never been to Paris. We didn't train on Paris. This is like a one image example and we can relight it and make it uh, look like you've been there and whenever you want, basically. Okay, so now I am very much over time. So I am going to stop here. We've looked at um, audio and motion. We've looked at uh, details. We've looked at visual patterns over time. Um, there's, there's some food for thought you can take out of here. Like, you know, for example, uh, AI and perception, we can use it to create tools for art and design. There's good and bad implications. You have to think about what happens when you make synthetic or fake uh, content. And um, we've talked about modeling all kinds of complex things and, and multimodal stuff, um, but there's a lot of stuff that's left to be done. For example, the, the example of the, of the person in the orchid and compositionality. And there's also the question of how do you not only provide tools that are creative, but also uh, create creative machines. And I think you're gonna learn about that more later this week. One final note is if you wanna learn more about perception and art, this is a great book by Margaret Livingston from Harvard. And these are collaborators. Thank you all collaborators. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very, very interesting and intriguing and inspiring. Um, cool. I'm sorry we went a little bit over time. Okay. I was trying to like lower the details. I'm sure that there are many interesting things I personally learned and uh, also students. Uh, hopefully it will inspire their uh, thoughts and their future work. Um, is, is there any question uh, from students? I think that most of them are thanking you and I see that in the chat. And oh, chat, okay. But, uh, yeah, I think that. Okay, cool. Excellent. Thank you again. It was a great talk. And Thank you. I'm very excited to, you know, uh, put this online so everyone can benefit from it. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye now. Bye.